between 1907 and 1911. Despite bridge-smashing icebergs, glaciers that threatened to devour the track, and temperatures falling to 60 below zero, the Copper River and Northwestern Railway was constructed through the wilderness of eastern Alaska. It was famous in its day, becoming the subject of a best-selling novel and a popular silent film. For a quarter century, it carried copper and silver down from fabulously wealthy mines and brought tourists up to view the dramatic scenery along the track. Then, more than 80 years ago, it was abandoned. The tracks were left to rot in the woods, and the railroad story is all but forgotten. That story began in July 1900, when Clarence Warner and Tarantula Jack Smith came walking up a lonely mountain valley. They were prospectors, part of a larger group exploring this corner of the District of Alaska, and they were investigating the region around the recently named Kennecott Glacier. After the men stopped for lunch beside a creek rushing down from the mountains, Tarantula Jack noticed a patch of bright green high on the mountain above them. He thought it was worth a look. Warner, who had sprained his ankle, was less enthusiastic. As they argued about what to do next, they realized that the creek beside them was spangled with chips of silver. Their quarrel forgotten, they followed the creek uphill, the silver chips multiplying as they approached the mysterious green patch. When they reached it, they discovered that the green patch was copper, an enormous outcropping of malachite and high-grade chalcosite ore. This discovery, the prospectors knew, was worth a fortune if they could find somebody to buy and develop their claims. They found that someone at Valdez, in the person of Stephen Birch, a young mining engineer from New York. Birch knew that copper prices were rising thanks to demand for copper wire in a nation rapidly embracing electrical power. And he also happened to know the patriarch of the wealthy Havermeyer family, who was looking for investment opportunities in Alaska. Acting on the Havermeyer's behalf, Birch quickly purchased the prospector's claims. To actually mine the copper at Kennecott, however, he and his backers would need millions in capital, and for that, they turned to the Guggenheims, who controlled a network of mines and smelters stretching from Colorado to Chile. The Guggenheims, in turn, invited J.P. Morgan to help organize the Alaska Syndicate, which would combine their resources and the Havermeyers with those of other firms and private investors interested in the last frontier. Under the Guggenheims' leadership, the Alaska Syndicate began to plan a railroad that would connect the copper mines with the sea. Of the various possible routes, each championed by its own investors, the Guggenheims preferred one beginning at the port of Katala, rejecting the alternative track proposed by Michael J. Heaney, the most famous railroad builder in Alaska. Heaney had become an Alaskan hero during the Klondike Gold Rush, when, despite sheer rock faces, gargantuan snowdrifts, and the schemes of local outlaws, he had built the White Pass and Yukon Railway, which connected the coastal town of Skagway with the gold fields. Now, Heaney was convinced that the new railroad to the copper mines should begin at a natural port he called Cordova, and follow the course of the mighty Copper River through the mountains before turning east toward Kennecott. It was a difficult route, rejected as impossible by other railroad builders because of the glaciers along the Copper River. But Heaney believed it could be built. In the end, he convinced the Alaska Syndicate to buy his right-of-way, and, after a storm destroyed their port at Katala, the Guggenheims recognized the superiority of Heaney's route and made Heaney himself their contractor in November 1907. Within weeks, hundreds of men were on the payroll. By spring, 3,500 were working on the road at a base wage of $3.50 a day. Eventually, there would be as many as 6,000 workmen at a time when the entire non-native population of Alaska was only 30,000. The first months of construction were hampered by blizzards and drifting snow. Spring brought warmer weather, but also seas of mud, as the men wallowed through the glacial outwash streams of the world's northernmost rainforest. Construction became even more difficult as the crews pushed into the Copper River Delta, a huge region, larger than Rhode Island, of marshes, sandbars, and swarming mosquitoes, where thousands of pilings had to be driven into the muck to support the grade. Further up the line, 
Men waded upstream in the Copper River's numbing current, towing boats filled with food and supplies for the crews working upstream. That winter, once the river froze, a 70-ton steamboat was disassembled, loaded onto dozens of sleds, hauled 80 miles through the mountains, and rebuilt on the banks of the Copper. After the spring thaw, that steamboat, 110 feet long, and piloted by men trained on the Mississippi River, began to ferry materials upriver. Eventually, it would be joined by two more steamers, including one with a hull specially reinforced to protect it from icebergs. Even fully loaded, the boats drew less than two feet of water. Supplied by the steamboats, teams of men worked to clear a grade through the many obstacles along the river. The most dramatic of these was Abercrombie Canyon, where the copper was compressed to a frothing torrent between a cliff and a 300-foot glacial moraine. Thousands of pounds of dynamite were needed to blast a grade along the cliff face. Wood Canyon, further upstream, required even more blasting. One especially epic explosion, involving 1,000 cases of black powder, hurled so much rock into the river that it created an enormous wave which nearly sank all three river steamers. Allen Glacier, a huge tongue of ice that bordered the river, represented an equally difficult problem. Since there was no way around or below it, five miles of track were laid directly on top of the glacier. Over the following years, as the glacier advanced and melted, the tracks had to be continually moved, reset, and repaired. The greatest challenge was the bridge at mile 49, which came to be known, in a considerable underestimate of its actual cost, as the Million Dollar Bridge. The river, 30 feet deep, a third of a mile wide, racing over its bed of boulders at 12 miles an hour, was formidable enough, especially during the spring thaw, when gargantuan sheets of ice plunged downstream. But it was the glaciers that were the real problem. There were two of them, one upstream and one downstream of the bridge site. The one downstream, Child's Glacier, ran right to the river's edge, towering 300 feet over the silty current. In warm weather, gargantuan masses of ice toppled into the water, sending waves crashing over the opposite bank. The real menace, however, was upstream, where Miles Glacier, larger than all the glaciers of Switzerland combined, poured an endless procession of icebergs into the river, some more massive than the steamers that hauled the railroad supplies. The biggest calvings sent huge waves downstream with a force that swamped barges and snapped pilings. After careful study of the site, plans were drawn up for a steel bridge supported by three reinforced concrete piers. Two of these piers, exposed to the brunt of the current and the largest icebergs, would be protected by detached icebreakers, also of reinforced concrete. Just before the river ice broke up in May 1909, a caisson, a watertight excavation chamber, was settled into position on the site of the first pier. Over the following weeks, as air compressors on shore kept the caisson from filling with water, men labored inside, digging to a point 50 feet below the mean water elevation before laying the pier's footings. The piers and icebreakers were completed over the winter, despite weather so cold that each load of concrete had to be heated to over 100 degrees Fahrenheit on shore, lest it freeze before it could be dumped. Gales gusting to 100 miles an hour howled over the construction site, flattening the windbreaks that protected the workmen and a freak December thaw caused the glaciers to shift, creating enormous ice jams above and below the bridge. But, by the middle of March 1910, the piers were ready. To save time and money, the engineers had decided to build the spans on false work, that is, on temporary wooden pilings driven into the river bottom through the ice, instead of the more expensive and time-consuming cantilever method. The danger of using false work was the fragility of the pilings. If these were shifted or snapped by a movement in the ice, any part of the span above that had not yet been bolted into place would collapse. If, in other words, the ice started to break up before the three main bridge spans were complete, the project could not be finished until the following winter, and might not be finished at all. At the beginning of April, when work on the bridge spans was scheduled to begin, the river ice nine feet thick, was still solid. But water was already backing up against the ice jam in front of Child's Glacier, and the ice began to rise, bringing the false work with it. 
Teams of men with chisels and steam points worked desperately to cut the pilings clear before they were torn from the river bottom. When the steel for the first two spans arrived, the crews were ready. Working in a single shift, with only short meal breaks, from seven in the morning to eleven at night, the men finished the first span in thirteen days, and the second in only six. But the steel for the critical third span, the one that bridged the central part of the river channel, was delayed. Days became weeks. April turned into May. The Copper Valley echoed with the trickle of meltwater and the resigned creak of old ice. Just as the steel for the third span finally arrived, the glaciers started to move. First the jam in front of Child's Glacier broke, and the river ice shifted downstream, forcing the engineers to supplement the false work with new pilings. Then Miles Glacier began to advance, shoving the river ice before it. Two shifts of thirty men were assigned to work around the clock with long ice chisels, trying to relieve the pressure on the false work pilings. During the final desperate push, the men labored day and night, trying to finish the span before the shifting ice carried the false work away. Dozens of steam hammers worked simultaneously, sparks fountaining from white-hot rivets, as the chisel teams hacked at the advancing flows. Around midnight, on May 16, 1910, the last bolt was driven home, and 300,000 pounds of steel settled into place. Only an hour later, the river ice began to break up. The pilings of the false work splintered and snapped. Fissures swallowed tools left on the ice and the whole monolithic mass of the river started to shudder downstream. The drama wasn't quite over. Only a few weeks after the completion of the final span, a tongue of ice emerged from the flank of Child's Glacier and began advancing toward the bridge. By mid-August, the wall of ice, 300 feet high, was advancing at a rate of more than 8 feet a day, plowing up a tidal wave of earth and bulldozing groves of trees. By the time it stopped at summer's end, the glacier was only 1,500 feet from the bridge. The Cup River had to be bridged again near the newly founded settlement of Chitna. Since another steel structure was deemed too expensive, it was decided that the tracks would cross on a wooden trestle. Every year, as long as the Cup River Railroad operated, the wooden bridge at Chitna was destroyed by the spring breakup. And, every year, it was hastily reconstructed. This process eventually claimed no fewer than 15 lives, as workmen, or railroad employees, were caught on the collapsing trestle. As another winter set in, the rails reached Cuscalana Canyon, a deep ravine cut by a swift river. Through the month of December, in temperatures that fell to 50 and 60 below zero Fahrenheit, a steel cantilever bridge was built. With the sun only scraping the horizon for a few hours each day, the work was done by the harsh glare of acetylene lights. The aurora flickering overhead, men hurried back and forth over creaking snow, bundled against the killing cold. The Cuscalana Bridge was completed on New Year's Day, 1911, and a track marched on over the tundra. Confronted with the deep valley of Gilehina River, work crews built a wooden trestle 880 feet long and 90 feet high, blasting holes in the permafrost for the support pilings. Despite temperatures falling into the 60s below zero, which made the timbers shatter and split, the bridge was completed in only eight days. A late winter blizzard touched off avalanches that buried some of the canyon grades beneath 60 feet of snow and rubble. But locomotives equipped with rotary snowplows were driven through, and construction continued. On March 29, 1911, a sunny day with a high temperature just above freezing, the tracks finally reached the mines at Kennecott. With Chief Engineer E.C. Hawkins presiding, a copper spike was driven into the final tie. After a moment of silence in remembrance of Michael J. Heaney, who had died the previous winter, Hawkins cabled a message to Cordova. The Copper River and Northwestern Railway had been completed. In three years and four months, despite some of the harshest weather and most difficult terrain on the planet, they had built a railroad 196 miles long. They had constructed 30 miles of bridges and trestles. They had excavated more than 5.5 million yards of earth and stone. The project had cost more than $23 million. But now it was done, and the copper could reach the sea.
at an incredible 70% pure. The first copper ore from Kennecott was so rich that it did not even have to be milled. Well over $200 million of copper would come down the Copper River and Northwestern Railway, making profits in excess of $100 million for the Guggenheims and their Alaska syndicate. The railroad's glory days, however, were short-lived. Within a quarter century, exhaustion of the mines and the onset of the Great Depression made the road unprofitable. The last train from Kennecott ran in 1938. Although some of the rails were pulled up for scrap, most of the railroad was simply left to decay. The southern end of the grade, starting from Cordova, was converted into a gravel road, which eventually reached the Million Dollar Bridge. But the Good Friday earthquake of 1964, which badly damaged the bridge, put an apparently permanent halt to those plans. I visited the Million Dollar Bridge a few weeks ago. Although Miles Glacier still releases a barrage of icebergs every summer, the ice has melted back several miles since 1910, leaving a wide expanse of open water. Child's Glacier still looms over the river, though the huge waves caused by falling ice are rarer than they once were. The bridge, however, is still there, a monument to the ingenuity and determination of the men who built the Copper River and Northwestern Railway. Click on the card in the upper right of this screen, or on the link in the description, to watch the video about my rafting trip down the Copper River in search of the railway's remains. I'd like to thank Dennis Keough at the Cordova Historical Museum for meeting with me and sharing his collection of historic photos. I'd also like to thank McCarthy River Tours and Outfitters, and especially guides Sam Cox and Jake Bartolik for their help during my trip down the Copper River. And finally, thanks to all of you for watching.